Look, before we focus on this one important ship, tell us first about the British Royal Navy's anti-slavery squadron and its mission and the fact that it existed. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's really interesting because I'm obviously from the United States, I'm sure folks can hear. And uh, we sort of think of the slave trade as having just sort of magically ended one day by congressional <laughs> act. Which is not accurate, but that's sort of how we think of it, right? And for y'all, though, uh, in Britain, there was obviously a much more concerted effort that went through Parliament, lots of grassroots stuff. And there was actually enforcement which we didn't do. <laughs> um, and so in order to enforce a prohibition against the slave trade, you have to have someone to do it. And the best place to do that is on the seas. So you end up with the Royal Navy, a uh, first under the color of war during the Napoleonic Wars, using that to sort of stop and detain ships. And then they had to do it by treaty. Wonderful. Okay, right. So and of that squadron, then why is the black joke the most the, the most famous part of it? It was fastest. I know that's not like a really... That's um, a great answer. Yeah. answer. But it is. <laughs> that's mm. the reason. Um, it was a recaptured slave ship itself. So it was actually a Baltimore clipper, um, likely built in Baltimore, but in the United States anyway. And it was the fastest ship on the water, even when it was a slaver. So when it was caught, luckily, um, and repurposed by the Royal Navy, it was still the fastest ship on the water. I read a really interesting paper where they said that the Black Joke had a Batman effect, where essentially no one even wanted to go in the area of the Black Joke's patrolling because they were concerned that it would catch them that quickly. Wow. And so, I mean, when the when the British, so, I mean, presumably it's a boat that the, the boat that the British knew, boat, should I say boat or ship? Correct me if I'm wrong. It was a boat that the British knew about beforehand. Did they know immediately what to do with it when they caught it? They thought we're going to repurpose this. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the use of repurposed, what we call the tender, was a little bit controversial um, in the Admiralty, and the policy wouldn't actually last um, beyond like the 1830s, really, used this way. But um, they did to that extent. They had already started using sort of recaptured slave ships as tenders to British vessels to sort of make up for the deficits of ships that were originally built to fight wars against Napoleon, instead now being used to sort of patrol waters mm. on the coast, western coast of Africa. And so tell us a bit about what this what this boat did and what, what, the, what the crew of it did. How often did they have to sort of fight and engage with slave traders? I mean, because you, you said they had a, a Batman effect keeping them away, but presumably they actually sort of caught them quite a lot as well. Yeah, they they, oh, they did. Uh, they had the most successful record in the squadron as well. I probably should have put that earlier. And uh, but what they had to do, it wasn't actually as often as we think, right? Because their patrolling area was about three thousand miles easily. And so in order to actually catch someone, you would basically just have to cruise around for days and days and days on end. So they have the best record by far, but they actually only participated in approximately, approximately. 13 ship captures. Right. Okay. Over the course of four years. Do we know how many slaves were freed by the by the ship and indeed by the by the squadron altogether? Yeah, they they estimate for the ship at least they estimate approximately three to five thousand. Um, okay. if you sort of put it all together. Um for individuals, right? If you went with sort of Commodores, there's you can get into the ten to twenty thousand. Um for the squadron entire, it's a little more difficult to measure because first you have this squadron, then you have the one that was actually on the Cape, and then eventually you have a shift in theater to the eastern coast of Africa to prevent slave trading over there more later in the um nineteenth century. So uh, that's a little bit more difficult to estimate. Mm, okay. Now, look, so, I mean, people hearing me introduce this as the British Navy versus the slave trade might think that the Brits were like the, the heroes of the hour. But of course, Britain played a, a huge role in the slave trade uh, beforehand, right up until the, the abolition of the Slave Trade Act in what, 1807 and the slavery mm -hmm. ab abolition law as well. How important is that sort of context? I mean, particularly when, when, when writing this book, how conscious are you of, of, of not, not letting the Brits, Brits be Batman because there's a history here as well? Oh, I mean, again, American, so pretty conscious. <laughs> <laughs> Quite, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I do think that there is something to be said for the fact that, yes, it's, it's involved cleaning up a mess that in part Britain made, right? Mm. Um, it had the largest share in the slave trade at that point. The United States exiting the slave trade, international slave trade, not the domestic slave trade. Um, when they did was, it was a drop in the bucket. The U.S. had maybe 2% of of the market share at that point britain had more like 40 percent, mm. so yeah. it was a huge huge deal um when they not only stopped but then decided to go the opposite direction so that that should be said it was also still quite contentious like i think we like to think of these things as once they're decided it's settled and everybody sort of agrees that this moral wrong has been sort of dealt with and sort of went along with it and that is not really the case of what happened and eventually that's what uh, sort of 
uh, spells issues and problems for the Black Joke and the squadron generally is that there were folks in the Admiralty, namely William IV, the Sailor King, who were not on board with this mission at all. As the Duke of Clarence, he'd actually argued against ending the slave trade in Parliament. So, wow! And so, they, I mean, so they were not on board with the with with the, with the mission because they didn't wish to damage the slave trade in this way, or because they thought it was a poor use of Britain's resources, or what was the rationale there? I was going to say yes, but um, <laughs> it was not just so they didn't want to waste the resources. They thought it would be incredibly damaging to the economy. That was a huge one. Um, There's also a lot of personal investment. When you have 40 percent of a market share of a, at that point, you know, we're talking huge astronomical amounts of like industrial type money Mm -hmm. you know folks have interests in that you know people own ships people um are invest in slaving voyages you know and they still have we're doing that to that point so yeah okay so i'm I'm not sure we can really sort of talk about spoilers when it's history but without wishing to give spoilers um would it be correct then to say that rather than being like the sort of this i don't know this sort of great british-led heroic effort that this finally stumped out stumped out the slave trade this was something that that could have done much more than it did but it was sort of curtailed yeah and i for some people there were definitely folks who were true believers who Mm. were in this because they opposed slavery vehemently and vociferously and vocally um and there were folks who were like that but for a lot of people it was also a job and it was sometimes a job politically that they did not agree with Mm. almost just as vocally. Um, so you do end up with a situation wherein uh, as much as we want to make it like this uncomplicated narrative, it is complicated and it really varies based on the individual and their motivations within that wider context. How much do we know about the crew of the Black Joke? Because this was this was a multiracial crew, was it not? Mm-hmm. It was. And we, we do not know as much as we could, but there is a surviving logbook from the first part of um, its tenure under the British. So uh, we know somewhat, right? We know that they had an African cook whose name was Jean-Francois. We know that there were, and obviously the closer you get to the officer class, the, no, the more we know about people. Mm-hmm. There was a very heroic midshipman um, who was 15 when he sort of did something very cool. We won't go into it. <laughs> um, but like we have his letters still that he would send to his family, Edward Hind, you know, or Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Um, So we know a decent amount, all things considered. And because they sort of rotated through so many captains, the captain of the Black Joke was actually always a lieutenant from its parent ship. So let's call that the Sybil or the Dryad. Um, So because of that, we actually know a little bit more because they kept rotating through. But when it comes to sort of the everyday um, aspect of it, it's limited. But Mm. good stuff like we have songs they wrote after uh you know capturing ships and stuff like that which is pretty cool how much do we know about what would happen when they captured us a, a ship are we talking like full sort of master and commander sort of swinging to the deck and hand-to-hand combat or was it more kind of um was it was it more uh more mundane than that yes <laughs> <laughs> Um, sometimes it was incredibly mundane. Sometimes it was incredibly frustrating. There's one incident where uh, a slaver led a captain of the Black Joke on sort of a merry chase just because he felt like it. It wasn't while he was at the Black Joke at the time. And um, the captain decided that he was just over this. This is ridiculous. So when he finally caught the guy, didn't have any slaves on board. He just just said he wanted to test himself (laughs) against these, you know, fast ships or whatever. And so um, Huntley was the captain at the time. So he like unstrings the guy's sails. He like dumps all of his stuff into the ocean. He literally does everything he can because he's so annoyed with this man for having made him chase him across the water, right? So it could be like that petty. Or it could be, um, in the case of the Marinerito, it could be, um, you know, a full-on multi-day, into the night, like, c- combat, you know, people, dramatic swings across decks, the whole work. So it really just depends. Wow. Look, look and this book is, in parts, obviously, it's it's heavy and disturbing detail about what life was like on board slave ships. Um, can you give can you give us a sense of that? Because we, we, we definitely ought to cover it. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, it's again, I don't think it's something we really think about. I think, well, especially in the United States, I won't speak for British education, but in the U.S., we tend to focus a lot on slavery. When we talk about slavery, we tend to focus on slavery in the context of it actually happening, right? Mm -hmm. On the ground, on the plantations, what was going on. Um, And there's less known, I think, or less discussed when it comes to what was happening on board the ships. Um, And there's a great book called Slavery at Sea that I I sort of referenced a lot that was really, really helpful. But 
one of the things that I think we don't really think about, for instance, is the smell. Like if we are keeping folks in completely unsanitary conditions for six weeks at a time on an ocean voyage, um, they would defecate in tubs in the middle of the ship and that would just sit there for mm. weeks. Um, and they did not have the same sort of like cleaning, cleaning practices that the Royal Navy used. The Royal Navy, you know, keeping things spick and span, that was not happening in the same way on slave ships. So, uh, so they also had like animals, right? There's like, we don't think about the actual physical reality of getting from point A to point B. And it was so sort of disease ridden. You could get so many um, terrible things just from existing in such an unsanitary space. But that was actually another reason that the Royal Navy ended up coming in on the side um, of abolishing the slave trade because they were losing too many able-bodied men who could be Jeez. sailors yeah. to um, the slave trade, not because they were being enslaved, but because they were working on slave ships and dying or being maimed it's, or just not from disease. Is there not is there not a detail that one ship could be smelt from a mile away on shore? So unsanitary was yeah. it on board? Yeah, and that's, that was not uncommon. That yeah. Most ships could be smelled from up to a while, mile away if the wind was blowing in the correct direction. Well, it's just remarkable. Look, what can we draw from this period of history then for for, to, for today about the the power of political will or the cost of failing in political will? Which which direction should we go in? Um, yes, <laughs> I'm just going to keep doing it. Um, I think that what we can learn about the cost of failure is that the longer you wait, the problems don't go away, right? And as much as it seems lovely, it's like, okay, well, we made a law or we did a thing or whatever. Sure, great, done. But without actually enforcing that, without actually putting some oomph behind it, without actually working to make sure that what that law or what that moment or policy is supposed to guarantee becomes a reality, it probably won't um, because forces will simply continue to operate, mm -hmm. right, without actually being halted. And when it comes to actually exercising political will, I think it's partially to say that these battles are long. Yeah. I think it's so easy to get disheartened because it takes, you know, it's like, oh, I've been, you know, caring about this. I've been calling about this. I've been writing about this for years and years and years and years. And it seems like very little has changed. And we're talking about, this book is about four years in what is ultimately an 80 plus year battle to really end the international slave trade as practiced at the time, which of course it still exists. Yeah. So, so there we there's go. still 